Hey everyone, I'm Brandon Kimber, the uh, director and producer of American Gospel, and I'm here today with my friends Chris Roseboro, Justin Peters, Steve Kozar, Jesse Westwood, and Richard Moore, um, who all, I'm sure you've realized, have appeared in the episodes that you've just watched. Um, and today we just would like to talk about um, what you just saw and kind of the backstory behind that. Um, recently, I released uh, some news related to Dr. Michael Brown's involvement or his uh, departure from the project, um, and that's kind of connected to uh, these episodes. Um, so I'd like to talk about that. But first, I just um, would like to see if any of you guys uh, have any thoughts about um, that news that released or the episodes or anything like that. I'd like to chime in and uh, note that I, I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm saddened by the fact that uh, Dr. Brown has uh, pulled out of the project, but I'm not surprised. Unfortunately, uh, in, in, I've been covering Michael Brown for quite a bit of time, and, uh, and we, we refer to him, and this is not a term of endearment, but we refer to him here at uh, Pirate Christian Media as uh, the Apostle of Obfuscation. This is a fellow that we've noted over the years has made a career Career out of basically creating credibility for people that shouldn't be given any credibility within the body of Christ, while legitimately demonizing uh, those who would criticize people in the charismatic movement who are who are teaching false doctrine and engaging in false practices. Michael Brown seems to play the position of basically doing everything he can to understate the uh, the, the the error that uh, that he's defending. And at the same time, really overstating just how dangerous the critics are. It's just fascinating to me that uh, he has no problem, legitimately very few issues whatsoever with Sid Roth. But uh, somebody like myself, he, he, he slanders me as being a hypercritic and being divisive and somehow dangerous to the body of Christ. So it doesn't surprise me that he, that he pulled out. Again, I'm saddened that he did. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Chris just said. And, and one of the things that's been a source of frustration for me, with not just with Michael Brown, but with all of those who uh, regarding this project, is one, it strikes me that uh, those, the leaders in the charismatic movement are far more offended when they perceive that we have said something uh, in error about one of the, the their leaders, uh, that is far more offensive to them than <laughs> these same people putting words in God's mouth that he did not say and misrepresenting God. They take far more offense at us misrepresenting one of them than they do on misrepresenting God. And uh, I, 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 I'm just completely struck by that. I, I see it over and over and over. And um, so that's one thing. And of course, none of us have uh, misrepresented any of the people that we have, we have been talking about. None of us have done that. Um, the other thing is that Michael Brown routinely says that, well, I'd, I've not watched Benny Hinn or I've not watched Sid Roth. Never mind that he's been good, close or close personal friends with Sid Roth for 40 years now, but he claims that the, uh, that he's never watched one of his programs. The only two that he's ever watched apparently, uh, are the, the two that one, he was a guest, a uh, guest on Sid Roth's program. And then the other one, he was a guest host of Sid Roth's program. So apparently those are the only two episodes that he's ever watched. So he's constantly claiming ignorance about the very people uh, that that all of us have rightly criticized, and yet he says that he's 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 not, you know, he's not watched any of them. So you would think that, given that all of us have watched people and we do know something about them, that he would defer to us, given that we've done the homework and he apparently has not. 
Yeah, I, I uh, second those thoughts. Um, one thing that I thought right away, I was just sad. You know, like um, I would really actually like to hear um, what he has to say and and uh, how he would justify any of the actions, especially in the two episodes we've just seen. Um, we have a plethora of evidence. Um, Justin brought that out um, in the episodes. There is just uh, really mountains of evidence. That's actually just half of the evidence maybe um, that you've seen in these episodes now of, of this practice. And uh, so I would really like to hear what he might have to say um, to um, defend it or justify it or, or maybe apologize, hopefully, um, and, and repent um, from these actions. Now, he himself m- would not have to, I don't believe, but um, he has run cover, unfortunately, for people in this movement for years. And my question actually would be to him, what would it take, actually? Um, for him to mark and avoid someone um, in his own movement. Or, uh, I mean, Paul says it in Romans 16, 17, uh, mark and avoid those who oppose sound doctrine. And um, what would it take for Michael Brown or anybody else for that matter, um, let's say in the NAR, in the uh, extreme charismatic movement, to mark and avoid such teachers? So, I w- I'm really sad, actually. I'd really love to see his his contribution, and I do appreciate uh, Michael Brown on on lots of things. Um, uh, but uh, I, I really would uh, would have would have loved to have seen uh, what he might have had to say in this. Yeah, and <clears throat> honestly, I, I echo Richard in a lot of ways. Um, as someone who's kind of I don't know fresh out of the charismatic movement, but was definitely deep in it. Uh, Dr. Michael Brown was one of those people I, I looked up to for a long time and I, I listened to a lot of and uh, would honestly base a lot of my theology and a lot of my understanding off of his videos and his his interpretations of things. And so um, for me, I, I learn best through discourse and through discussion. And I think the body can take a lot out of a healthy discourse. And um, if we really truly do see each other as brothers in Christ and as ironing sharpening iron, I think that's one of the best things we can do is, is have a discussion, um, especially on something as big as, as this topic of grave soaking. Um, the thing that, that really uh, surprised me was the response of it being something, you know, aberrant or minuscule or something that wasn't really done that much. And as you just saw in the, in the videos, like I, I was there and it was done and it wasn't just a one-off thing. It was a very active thing and it wasn't, just for a couple of days is for a couple of years. And, um, I really, the, um, the lack of severity in the, in the theology that is discussed is one of the things that I, I wish we could actually approach and have a good discussion on. So I echo Richard in that way. I would, I would have loved to see a full discussion and have that context. Um, I, I really do. Maybe at some point, maybe not in American gospel, another point, maybe we can have that discussion with them, but, um, it's always uh, it's always disappointing when you can you can get a perspective of someone who is on the other side, um, and you do your due diligence to let them have their perspective heard. Um, and uh, it's it's just it's a bummer. Okay, so I would say uh, you guys all said a lot of the things that I probably would have said myself. I, I'll just add that. Dr. Michael Brown does say some really good things on lots of other topics. He just did a video a few weeks ago about uh, Andy Stanley that I actually clicked the like button. I was rooting for him. It was really good. Uh, so I, I do want to give credit where credit is due. But in this area, yeah, he, uh, frankly, I'm glad he's not in the movie only because it seemed almost impossible. And then it actually showed itself to be impossible to make it all work, uh, to try to make everybody happy enough. And and he wanted to have his viewpoint expressed in such a way that really didn't make sense since it's Brandon's film. And it, it already had a, a tendency to veer towards a cessationist viewpoint. And I think he knew that, but then he seemed to pretend like he didn't know that. So I don't know. I think there maybe was some genuine misunderstanding, but I also think let's get this movie done. Let's make more. Let's get the information out there because there's a lot of confused people. And I think that the bottom line for Dr. Michael Brown is in this particular area, he's not helping. He's actually adding to the confusion. So I, yeah. I hope that we can just really help 
confused people who are in some cases on the on the verge of just giving up the faith and quitting God and quitting church that's that's much more important than these you know subtle little nuances of did we explain the new apostolic reformation perfectly enough so that they're all happy with us it gets exhausting after a while so yeah. those are my thoughts Brandon Thanks. I have a question for you Sure, and and that is, uh, did did Michael Brown watch the previous installments of American Gospel before he sat down for the interviews that you did with him? Because had he watched the two previous installments of American Gospel, I think he would have known exactly where you were coming from. Uh, to my knowledge, he has not to this day. Um, so, in Michael Brown's response. Uh, after I wrote that blog post, um, he explained, and I guess maybe I'll read this to you. He said on Facebook, uh, for those asking why I pulled out of American Gospel 3 after investing many hours of my time into it, the answer is that from the start, I had a written agreement that if I was not happy with the content and changes were not made to my satisfaction, I would withdraw. When I saw where the project was going, which was in a different direction than I was told it would be going. Now there's the key part right there. Despite my best efforts to get things pointed in the right direction, and when I saw that good people were being misrepresented and important issues dealt with unfairly, I could not lend my name to such a project. It was not honoring to the Lord, it was not healthy for the body, it was not fair to the viewers. Personal integrity, love for the truth, and concern for the well-being of the church caused me to withdraw. So back to that key point where he says um, the direction of the project changed from what he was told. So I don't think that's true at all. I told him my background, which is involved in the Toronto Blessing and hyper charismatic type of church. Um, I told him where I am now, which is more in the reform cessationist camp. Um, that I have that bias and that I would be interviewing people like you who have been his critics. I also pointed him to my past films, which the second film particularly, I interviewed people that I disagreed with, progressive Christians, Christians, uh, secular, uh, secular humanists named Bart Campolo. And I pointed him in that direction to see this is how I would edit someone's perspective that I disagreed with fairly while maintaining my perspective and bias like that would come through in the film as being the correct view. Um, so about a year or so after the interview, I was told, um, he told uh, a coworker of mine that he had not watched the films and up until a couple ago, he still did not confirm that he has watched those films. So I would really wish uh, Dr. Brown would uh, at least take some of the blame on that point that he could have known the direction of the project by watching the past films, but he agreed without watching unfortunately. Um, so <laughs> yeah, aside from that, um, you know, he mentioned, despite my best efforts to point the project in the right direction, I think that's also a little misleading. And we're going to get into that. I, we're going to show some clips, um, specific clips that he had issues with in two other episodes, not the ones that you just saw, but they are titled The Attraction and The Encounter. And we'll talk about what issues he had with those and I guess whether we think um, I misrepresented these people or dealt with those, foot, those clips unfairly. Um, I guess like overall, I'll try to explain from my perspective why he backed out. I included footage of him in these episodes and he approved of how I edited that, that footage. He was fine with it. He said I represented his, what he said fairly. I didn't take him out of context. 
Um, and in that, he was in basically full agreement with everyone else. Everyone was critiquing the encounter gospel, which is crit- crit- critiqued in the episode called The Encounter. Um, he had issues with these small other points where certain um, other people were describing their experience. For example, one brother named Matthew Tarpley attended the college Christ for the Nations. And um, he mentions that this was the closest thing um, to NAR that he experienced because the leaders were apostles and prophets and part of that movement. Dr. Brown had an issue with that because um, he for the nations. And of course, he doesn't believe the NAR exists. It's a myth. So that's just one example. Um, uh, I'd like to play the clip if if you want right. to do that now. Um, sure. And then we could sure. talk about it. Um, it's yeah. also tied in with another point that he objected to, but we could talk about that too. The college I went to is Christ for the Nations in Dallas, Texas. And that was probably the one group that could be identified the most as NAR. Preachers like Lance Wallnau, Cindy Jacobs, Damon Thompson, Dutch Sheets, those were sort of just leaders in that church. We decree that a third great awakening is our assignment. Birthing this third great awakening is our measure of authority. And I was really there when Dutch Sheets was the director of the school and was just pushing for this prayer movement, this third great awakening. And a third great awakening is coming to this nation. And it's going to give us the transformation that we need. And Todd White would speak all the time at Christ for the Nations. I mean. At the school, we would have nights where we just all came together in the auditorium and we'd watch Holy Ghost, that kind of stuff. And what you end up with is just a whole generation of young college-aged charismatics that just want to do that. I mean, Lou Engle and Todd White and all these guys would come and they'd speak at our school and they don't preach the Bible. They preach their lives. See, I I don't come up with sermons. I preach my life, man, because this is the only way I see, and I believe it's the only thing that's in the whole gospel. It's all about Jesus. They'll talk about themselves, their stories, their personal testimony, what they believe, what they think, what visions they had, and then they'll say, but it's all about Jesus. And then they'll go back immediately to talking about themselves and their visions and their dreams and their thoughts and their stories, but it's all about Jesus. It's a tremendous contradiction. So you'll get an hour and a half message where all it is is just stories of stuff that Todd White has done. And at the end, he'll say, all right, altar call, invitation time, come forward if you want stories like this too. If you want to be like me, come forward basically. And you're just, you look back and you just think, gosh, this stuff is so crazy, right? So again, Matthew says he attended uh, Christ for the Nations lists a, na- a, a group of names like Lance Walnau, Cindy Jacobs, Damon Thompson, Dutch Sheets, and briefly mentions that uh, that group could be identified the most as NAR. And that was a huge issue for Brown because, of, again, he, he teaches there and doesn't agree that that movement is really a thing. Um, the second point was the Todd White point. Um, Todd White, um, using his own words, explains he doesn't come up with sermons. He preaches his life. And, um, you know, Matthew explains that was his experience, the very thing Todd says about his own ministry. And apparently that's uh, that's not representing Todd correctly, according to Michael Brown. Um he believes Todd preaches uh, more out of the Bible. Now, I would agree that I think that's the case now more than it used to be, and that's because Michael Brown has actually been helping Todd White with his preaching. According to Todd White's own words and the Remnant guys, I, uh, that's the case. And so I think 
that's part of his objection. Any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll chime in here, and that is is that um, it is just a historical fact that uh, Todd White, you know, in his meteoric rise within the charismatic movement, uh, you know, he was he was preaching himself and proclaiming his signs and wonders and the things that he was doing. He he was a a, a very avid self promoter. Uh, of his own experiences and things like this. This is just a matter of historical documentation. Now, if there's been a change uh, and there's been coaching along the way, then you're going to note that that's a tacit uh, admission that what Todd was doing in the past was incorrect. It was it was inappropriate. And if he's if Michael Brown is needing to coach him so that he actually opens up a biblical text and exegetes it, and I recently have watched several of his sermons and he's still not good at that uh that you know that shows that uh, i i'll be blunt the man was never qualified to be a, a preacher or a teacher in christ church uh, scripture is clear that when it comes to those who teach in christ church they must be able to teach what's in accord with sound doctrine and to rebuke those who contradict it. They have to study and show themselves approved as workmen who need not blush with embarrassment, but who can rightly handle, rightly divide the word of truth. And Todd White has demonstrated over and over and over again that he struggles at those basic tasks that are necessary components of any teacher in Christ's church. Absolutely. I, I agree 100 percent. Let me quickly say uh, when, when when Michael Brown says that the NAR doesn't exist, this is an almost 900-page systematic theology for the New Apostolic Reformation. So here's a 900-page systematic theology for a movement that supposedly does not exist. Um, I think we all have a copy here. <laughs> ah, there you go. There you go. No, oh, there we go. All right. All right. So I'm not the only one. Good. Um, Mine are way so yeah, over there. Kind of kind of awkward, I guess, to to have that for a movement that doesn't exist. Yes. Can so I, that is I, that is Yeah. I was I just wanted to explain what I offered. Um sorry, my headphone just fell out of my ear. Let's try the other one. <laughs> I just wanted to explain um, what I offered Mike Brown. Um, so when he had these objections, I basically told him, um, I'm not going to change the experiences and the stories of other people involved. That's not part of our agreement that you get to edit what they say. But Michael Brown, if you would like to add your objections through recording some additional commentary, feel free. I'll put it right next to those clips so there's more balance and that you're happy. But he declined. So the idea that um, he, he gave his best efforts to get me pointed in the right direction, I don't think is a fair point because I offered him the ability to do that and he declined and i think the reasoning i mean it just sounds like to me that he was tired of giving more time spending more time doing this um maybe there's other reasons but that's all i could say <laughs> yeah i would uh echo those those thoughts from all y'all and uh justin as well um especially um in the the whole idea that that he's he's said this for years that the NAR is you know people critics of the NAR have created this construct that cannot be further from the truth. Um, the New Apostolic Reformation is a is a co phrase coined by missiologist C. Peter Wagner. My father-in-law was a student of C. Peter Wagner's at Fuller in the uh, 70s. Um, it's not even academically honest. Um, so Michael Brown uh, prides himself on being an acad academician, and um, especially in the languages, and that's his, uh, that's his specialty. But if he just looked a little bit into it, 
Um, there are plethora of academic articles on this subject. Mm -hmm. It is not a construct. It is not, it, 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 he cannot hold that position anymore and be academically honest. Um, I've been writing about it for some time. Yeah. There you go, Steve. Uh, you know, um, we, we've held up the, the, we've held up the, we all have copies of the three volume systematic theology by Harold Eberly, forward yeah. by C. Peter Wagner. And C. Peter Wagner in the foreword says that his, uh, Eberly's uh, theological position, the father son theology, is tantamount to open theism. Open theism was rejected yeah. out of hand by the evangelical uh, theological society early 2000s with Piper, Grudem, actually, and um, uh, others as well. Um, uh, Norman Geisler, uh, for instance. So uh, Harold uh, Br Brown needs to do his homework, honestly, like literally his academic homework. These things are easy to find. The paper by C. Peter Wagner, sorry, I'm going on a little bit, but the paper by C. Peter Wagner in night, uh, I think it was 2000, somewhere in that time frame, he talked about his own missiological journey and how he became a part of the movement and a card carrying member, but not only a card carrying member, but a propagator of this movement. So Brown needs to educate himself in this. Um, it is not a construct. It's not an Illuminati. We have not created this thing. Um, I'm a latecomer to the party, as it were. But in the last few years, I have in investigated it on an academic level, and it exists. There's no question it exists. And um, he, he's, he's, he's gaslighting, really, gaslighting. Then I wanted to say something about your, the, the thing you uh, had read, uh, Brandon, uh, I think it's part of it was part of Brown's statement. He said that this documentary and people's perspectives in it dishonor the Lord. That is deeply, deeply insulting. My perspectives, just as all you guys' perspectives here, none of us seek to dishonor the Lord. I've walked with the Lord for nearly 40 years, um, and that is deeply, deeply uh, hurtful. For him mm -hmm. to say that about the people in this film, you yourself, Brandon, you are not dishonoring the Lord, and I want to correct that. I'm sorry. that That's a little strong, but um, it's strong of him to say that everybody who appears in this film, people who've given their voice to it, and people who've put it together, your company and, and others who've invested time in research, even behind the scenes. I see, we see a lot behind the scenes. People have invested in this to honor the Lord. Right. And to call his church to accounts, not to dishonor the Lord. And um, it, him not looking at your film before, it's easy. It's an easy watch. The first film, you, he could have easily watched it. It's not intellectually honest of him being part of a project, not having looked at the first films. Yeah, that's right. Uh, if, if I can chime in here, Richard, that's exactly right. You know, we, we seek to honor Christ in this, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier. And I just want to reiterate this point that one of the things that bothers me so much about all of this is that, is that um, Dr. Brown and others, they seem they take far, far more offense at what they perceive to be something inaccurate that's said about them, even though none of us has done that. That, that bothers them, them exponentially more than the the constant misrepresentation of God and putting words in God's mouth that he does emphatically did not say the legions of false prophecies that all of these people have offered the the poor and the sick and the desperate that they have exploited for personal financial gain and the the blasphemies and the heresies some of the most egregious blasphemies that had been taught in the charismatic movement, not only is it heresy and blasphemy, but they actually attribute these very blasphemies to God himself. They say that they receive these teachings directly from Christ. And so they add sin upon sin. It, that doesn't bother them nearly as much 
as what they perceive to be as some slight against one of their one of the leaders in their own movement. Yeah, yeah I just want to say sorry, yeah. Jesse. Just real okay. quick, I I don't think I'm incapable of making a mistake or taking someone out of context. If people think that, I take it very seriously and I try to look into it and double check. Uh, with the things that Brown brought up, I thought I had enough evidence and I sh- I communicated that to him, but he just did not agree. So I'll leave it at that. Jesse, before you jump in, I, I would uh, make one. I would offer to Dr. Brown, if he ha- happens to watch this, wrote an academic article for the Evangelical Review of Theology, the World Evangelical Alliance's uh, academic journal called The New Apostolic Reformation and Its Threat to Evangelicalism. If he's uh, not sure or not up to date on what the New Apostolic Reformation is and its history, I chronicle that in that article. I'd be willing to send it to him for free. Um, And it is a read. He would have to read it. but it is a relatively short read. If he's uh, got so much, not enough time on his hands, I'd be uh, be very glad to send that to him, and he can rebut anything that I've written in that, and any of my sources that I, I have. I think I have some seventy-five sources in a in a ten-page article. So all firsthand accounts, all C. Peter Wagner's words, Shay on and the rest in this movement, and their own word. So he's welcome to rebut that if he wants he can have that and i can send it to him yeah whenever i hear you guys talk i feel like such a little fish in a big pond (laughs) because you guys have such a vast array of experiences and knowledge and for what i can add um especially being kind of the token hogwarts alumni here um (laughs) The uh, we actually as Bethel students, we would actually go to Christ for the Nations. Um, I went there twice while I was at Bethel um, because we kind of saw it as a sister campus. Um, we would go out there. We had other friends that were out there. Uh, we would you know participate in their classes, hang out. Um, and Todd White was part of the circuit that came out to Bethel as well. And he that it's very much true that the sermons were just testimonies, and that was very much the practice for many of these guys. It was it was basically a an hour and a half, two hour spiel of testimonies, be it Heidi Baker, Todd White, you know, Cheon, um, even some of the more quote unquote scholarly or more well read people, um, like Dr. Randy Clark. He would do a a, a seven day healing school intensive at Bethel, and many of those days were just days of testimonies and you just sat there for, for listening to testimonies. And at the end of it was the altar call, which was, if you feel call for healing, come up and get your impartation to become a healer. You know, that that's essentially what it was. And so the, the perspective of saying that Christ of the nations is not nor, um, it reminds me very much of kind of the linguistic theft and the semantics of grave soaking where, you know, Bethel can say, oh, we never did grave soaking because they never called it that. You know, that's kind of what we talked about in that episode before was that they never called it that so they can honestly say they never did that. And it seems like we're getting hung up on semantics rather than the content, um, which is kind of like the proof over yeah. promise idea, which is like what what is actually happening versus what we're saying what we're doing. And um, I feel like if we could just get past that hurdle as a church, and really have an honest discussion and um, which I feel like Brandon, you've been really good at doing is building a, a steel man argument rather than a straw man argument. Um, something I've always appreciated about your approach is you, you really want to find the best of the best. And arguably Dr. Brown would be the best of the best in this arena. Um, he's one of the, 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 the leading voices and to bring him on in this project is, is to steel man, the continuation is charismatic new Alec aside. And it's unfortunate, the comments and the decision that he's made, because we've now gone from having a strong steel man to having to kind of take what we can and and work with it. Um, Because I, I, I think when we have a strong argument for both sides, you really do leave it up to the audience to decide what's going on. Um, And so that's, you know, all that to say that um, it's, it's just unfortunate that, uh, rather than um, worrying about, is it um, is it, like you, you put it good? You put it well when you said you can't change the stories of the people that have been there because you can't. There's there's just testimonies. Like if 
he were to ask me to change what I said what happened to Bethel, did he did he see my segment on grave soaking? He's gonna ask me to say that didn't happen because like it did. And so what do you what do you do with that? So I um it's it's just an overall disappointment and I really hope that uh in some ways we can, you know, pick up some of the pieces here. Okay, so right here. John G. Lake, Apostle to Africa. This is some of the historical fiction about John G. Lake, written by Gordon Lindsay, founder of Christ for the Nations. If, if there is any one person who could be said to be the founder of the New Apostolic Reformation or, or who was teaching those things before it ever used that term, it would be John G. Lake. There's a direct connection between the original Pentecostals and then the uh, latter reign movement in the late 1940s, Gordon Lindsay was the founder and organizer of that entire movement. And he is the link between the early Pentecostals and people like Todd White today. So for Dr. Michael Brown to say that the New Apostolic Reformation doesn't exist is, is frankly, in my opinion, is a worthless thing to, for us to waste our time trying to argue about because it's so obvious that he's wrong. It's so obvious. The evidence is overwhelming. All he can do is say, well, I know somebody and he said this and I've got some friends and they told me that. He doesn't do anything academically and he's juggling lots of things. He's spinning lots of plates and maybe there are areas where he does do a lot of research and does do the, the due diligence. But in this area, he does not. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm not an academic, but I'm a really serious detail guy. And so, um, one of the first thoughts I had, Brandon, when you showed that clip about um, how, uh, you know, is it true that that um, Todd White is teaching more bib biblically now than he did in the past? The real question is, why is this man still, quote unquote, in ministry at all? Why right. is anybody of any reputation who takes God and his word seriously not, and, and he has a relationship to Todd White, why is he not saying, young man, you need to step down? He's not even that young. You are, you are so utterly disqualified to be doing what you're doing. Please stop embarrassing the name of Christ by pretending to be some, some sort of minister with some sort of ministry. Your whole ministry is a joke. It's worse than a joke. So um, I get really worked up about this stuff because I've studied Todd White over and over and over again for hours and hours and hours. And he's just... You know, when he goes away, they're going to bring a new guy because the patterns don't change. The people change, the names come and go, but the patterns remain the same. If you have a good story, if you can get on stage and you can entertain people with your stories and all of this so-called miracle stuff going on, you don't have to have any proof. Just start to cry at some point. People will throw money your way and they'll throw support your way and you can get backed by people like Jesse Duplantis and Kenneth Copeland. I'm looking at you, Daniel Kalenda. You're a big fan of Kenneth Copeland. Don't pretend you're not. These people are all the same. They're all in the same group. And um, one of the things, one of the reasons why I'm so adamant about getting more content out and getting it out faster is because the, the, the evidence is overwhelming. It's just that nobody's looking at the evidence. It's not like we got to try to find these hidden things that, you know, ooh, it's so hard to find. I mean, I'm just looking at primary source documents from the people who are in the movement, who founded all of the institutions, whose books are being used. It's, it's hey, not hard. It's, Steve, a question for you. Yes. Um, this just came to mind. Um, this problem of people who are not qualified to teach being pushed onto platforms, do you, would you agree that it could stem from this overemphasis on impartation or someone who's anointed they have this mm -hmm. radical testimony they appear to um, have received power and they're pushed on the stage they don't well i don't they think don't they have the knowledge i think that they they climb on stage willingly and people prop them up but you're exactly right the the issue of impartation and having this super power and this super mantle thing that goes back to the latter rain movement it's no different than what's happening in the new apostolic reformation and the assemblies of god spoke and wrote against it in their 1949 position paper and i brought this up in in more than one of my videos because everyone thinks oh these cessationists are all 
you know, this this tiny little cluster. I've even heard somebody refer to us as the cessationist mafia. And well, then I guess the Assemblies of God is part of the cessationist mafia because even they are against this idea of these super, you know, mantle. Uh, what, what they, they have mantles and they have anointings, they have impartations. And if you yeah. go to their meetings, they'll lay hands on you and now you get that impartation. I'm looking at you, Randy Clark, I'm looking at you, Rodney Howard Brown. That's what they're all teaching. It's coming through movies now with, you know, the domino revival. You can now cinema soak or get movie mantles through watching a film. I don't guarantee that will happen through this film, but apparently <laughs> yeah, that's the new thing. <laughs> Here's where I want to chime in. And that is, is that when you do the historical research, so I was in the latter rain movement in the, uh, in the late eighties and in the first year of my marriage. And I was there when, when prophets were restored to the church. And that was the phrase that was used. I had a prophetess over me uh, in the church that I went to, if you can even call it a church. And, uh, and I can point you to the sentences and the chapters written by C. Peter Wagner, where he talks about in the early 2000s, God restored apostles to the church. I want to make something very clear that it is only people who are academically and historically dishonest and purposely trying to gaslight us that claim that the church has always been continuationist. It's baloney. The, the, uh, the Pentecostals of the early stripes were all restorationists. When you read Frank Bartleman's book on the uh, eyewitness to Azusa Street, he was, not a, he was not a continuationist. He was a restorationist. He believed that God restored the gifts to the church. In fact, he has a whole narrative in, in that book explaining how the Holy Spirit disappeared because he was offended uh, by the fact that the early church be, uh, put in structure and had uh, an org organized church services. According to Bartleman, the, that, that will drive the Holy Spirit away. And it took more than a millennia for the Holy Spirit to return and for th these gifts to be restored. For all those people out there who say that uh, you, you, can, you cessationists are just evil and wicked and you're up to, a, you have diabolical means, I would note that the earliest Pentecostals were all cessationists and believe that God restored these gifts. And I was in the latter rain when prophets were restored and see Peter Wagner claimed that they were restored, which means that they ceased until they were restored. So I just, I just have to point that in there because this absolute dishonesty on their part, the church has always been historically cessationist. And I, and if you don't believe me, well then tell me who were the great apostles of the 13th century, 14th century, 15th century, name who the great prophets were of that time. There weren't any. Mm. Uh, yeah, can I, I, I know we're way out of ahead. order here. Can I jump in? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes, Chris, you got you got you got me fired up there, man. Um, it is they, he does they, that. The, the the movement um, the movement uh, it barters in revisionism, no question. Yeah, I, I want to piggyback on what you said there um, because um, they say that the NAR uh, doesn't exist. Um, that's revisionist history, first of all, and then secondly, I just even lately, uh, well, it's not lately; it's about a year ago the Rediscover Bethel podcast, Dan Farrelly, the pastor of Bethel, said that um, the, uh, the reformers, Luther, uh, Calvin, and then he named others like Spurgeon and even then Wesley a little bit later in that whole pod, he said they were all apostles and they just did not know that they could call themselves apostles. They didn't know the word to use as if Luther, who translated the Bible in six months in Wartburg, here in Germany, did not know the word apostolos. Can you imagine that, Chris? Um, no. <laughs> yeah. So, no, they, re they, they, they barter in revisionism history. So they have to revise history to insert apostles all throughout and sprinkle it throughout. Although all those reformers would have rejected the term out of hand, and they did. What they were doing was fighting apostolics. So these guys, I'm sorry, they don't know, they, either they don't know history or they reject history, or I, I don't exactly know what their, their motives are to, to build in apostles and prophets all throughout 
uh, church history, previous church history, and it's just not there. You're right. And, and classic Pentecostalism, we're cessationists. Um, yep. So, and um, th- th- then I also wanted to say, um, uh, along with uh, jump on uh, Steve's comments or the question to Steve from Brandon about uh, the anointing. Um, I, I wrote a, a paper for as well for the uh, evangel- uh, the, uh, the Pentecostal uh, Association here in Europe and presented that at the summer conference last year. And if you take the, the, the construct that they've built of the anointing out of that bottom of the house of cards that they've built, then the whole thing crumbles. We are all anointed in Jesus Christ. That's Every right. single Christian is sealed and anointed. On the day they received Jesus Christ as Lord mm-hmm. and Savior. And no one is more anointed than another. And I will That's die right. on that hill. And uh, they've created a construct from the Old Testament anointing all the way through and, and created it as some, some mystical, magical power that people have to heal people. That is never, ever described in the New Testament. So, Steve, I, I, I confirm that. The, the anointing... Some people do uh, kind of get pushed onto stage because they're seen as having some mystical anointing, but most crawl onto stage because they want to be on stage. <laughs> Richard, can I take no. issue with one thing you said? And that is, is, you said this isn't mentioned in the in the New Testament. I would disagree. I think in the Olivet Discourse, when Christ is talking about warning us about false Christ and false apos, apo, uh, prophets, uh, the pseudo Christoi, uh, that that term itself, false anointed ones, if you were false to just trans, yeah, false exactly. anointeds, yeah. that I think is what Christ was getting at. I think he was warning us about the false anointed ones and the people who nowadays claim that they have these special anointings. Pseudo Christoi is your term. So it is in the New Testament. No, I, just get, not I agree with that. It yep. ain't yep. positive, yeah. though. I, yeah. I would say, too, yeah. that um, to kind of to piggyback off of what that question, it's really it's a really good question because it really gets to the heart of um, re- really the issue in the qualifications of teachers. Um I wasn't one for the longest time to even question what someone's schooling was or background was. It's usually what was their resume and, and testimonies. Like what, what, what have they seen done? You know, I think of guys like David Hogan that we would like, we would love to have them come by or Heidi Baker or uh, Georgian Banoff. Those guys would come and never said, I ask where did they go to school, where did they get their degree. It was, Oh, here's this missionary. Here's this apostle. Here's this healer. Here's all the things they've seen. Now they're coming to preach. It wasn't, you know, here's their resume as far as degrees go, the books they've written, the, you know, commentaries they've done, nothing like that. It's it's strictly just a, a resume of, of testimonies. And it's, if you got racked up enough testimonies, if you racked up enough experiences um, you then would start being seen as one of those that stood out. You would start developing your resume of, oh, this guy saw X amount of healings. This guy, there was one guy there, um, he was a third year when I was in first year, and his he, he interned under Teresa Dedman. And his whole thing was he had really unique healings off of doing art. And his whole, he has an art anointing. And that was like, that was his thing. And so you would go to his classes and you would sit under him to learn how to do that. Um, prophetic art it, yes yeah absolutely and it was you know and it was these unique experiences but it had nothing to do with the scripture nothing to do with actually rightly dividing the word nothing to do with actually understanding the context of the word simply what miracles have you seen and what anointing do you have and are you called to do that um and it, they, they would really find themselves in the bind when you would have people um oh i'm blanking on the name now he was the guy that was the janitor and he went. Uh, he ended up being a big Jason Westerfield. Festival. Jason Westerfield. He's a prime example of that. Where zero schooling, zero actual study or um, mentorship, strictly just here's a guy that has a crazy experience. He's our janitor. He's anointed. He's supposed to be prophesying. Let's 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 you know raise him up. And then now he's you know God knows where he's as far as like teaching about aliens and new age stuff, but. What were his qualifications? He had an encounter. That's it, and that's, that's right. and that's the and that's the accountability he's held by. Yep. I, 
one of the great ironies in, in all of this, and I, I think all of you would agree with me, uh, as cessationists, I hear all the time, we all do too, oh, you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. You don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. To the contrary, I have such a high view of the Holy Spirit of God that I do not believe that someone can teach these blasphemies, heresies, offer the false prophecies, exploit the poor and the sick and the widows for personal financial gain, bring this untold reproach upon this for years and years and even decade upon decade, be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and feel no conviction about this. My view of the Holy Spirit as a cessationist is far too high to allow for that. If they were truly indwelt by the Holy Spirit, then they would be brought under such heavy conviction that that, that they would repent, uh, not continue in this for decades. So it, it, it is one of the great ironies in all of this discussion is that the 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 word of faith the NAR people would look at us and say we have a low view of the Holy Spirit. To the contrary, it is they who have a low view of the Holy Spirit of God. As a cessationist, I cede no ground in my pneumatology to these folks. None at all. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Um, I think I would like to move on to our next clip, which is from Tara. I think we have two more clips. Is that right? That's three right. Three total. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at, at, at the second clip. So then after high school, when I graduated, I was accepted into a dance company um, and I moved to Dallas, Texas. And that's where I started to go to Gateway Church that was pastored by Robert Morris. And um, in the company, since it was a Christian company, we had dance classes, but then we also had like Bible studies. And I was um, introduced to Bill Johnson, Heidi Baker, and Todd White's teachings. All right. Well, that, that clip didn't really seem like much, did it? The mere mention of Gateway Church was a problem. Um, she didn't call it NAR. She just mentioned that she went there. And uh, I guess in our conversation, um, I mentioned that I had also interviewed another brother who used to be a pastor there, who no longer is, but considers Gateway, the church he was involved with, as part of the new apostolic reformation. And so hearing that, oh, you're going to have a story connected to Gateway Church. Gateway's not NAR. Well, Dr. Brown, I mean, I'm looking in Modern Day Apostles written by Cheon and Robert Morris and his apostle, Jimmy Evans, both endorsed that book. And Cheon yeah. is uh, calling Gateway part of the New Apostolic Reformation. Why would they endorse that, that if they aren't part of it? Um, so he just said, like, well, people endorse books they don't agree with all the time. So <laughs> it's like, well, I have I have the evidence. Um, I have the experience uh, of testimonies. Uh, you, you can feel free to disagree or connect me with Gateway. And if they, de you know, deny that they're part of that movement, I'll be happy to write. Gateway Church denies being a part of the New Apostolic Reformation um, in the film. But <laughs> it just wasn't um, really up for debate for him. I mean, he tried to make it seem like, well, I, I, I always have to be right. Well, I'm just, I'm just seeing the evidence. And, I mean, we got to agree to disagree. <laughs> so we kind of got stuck on that point. Um, but yeah, that's that's a simple, another very minor point throughout this this whole um, episode that is just um, it's focused on bigger issues like what is true repentance? How do we preach the gospel um, correctly? Like on the street evangelism, like these are these are the bigger issues that he was kind of like ignoring and just pointing well. 
they called Gateway Church or CFNI NAR. And it's like, I can't, I can't really do this if he's going to be that picky about these small details and, and decline to add his, you know, further disagreement and commentary. So what do I do? Yeah, it's a stick, you stick to your guns because it's well documented that Gateway Church has an apostolic leadership. This is just well e- easy to get at. I mean, just go to their website. It talks about these things, you know, and I don't understand. I it, it, Except for Dr. Brown is constantly running interference. And he it, what's weird is, is that, you know, I spend my weekdays researching, 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 listening to people, going back and re-listening to what I've just listened to, taking notes then on the third try and trying to work this all out and how how to put this together. I don't see Michael Brown putting even any effort at all into researching to see if, if the claims that you're making can somehow hold water because it doesn't take more than five minutes to recognize that, wait a second, uh, Gateway Church, Jimmy Evans is the apostle of uh, uh, of uh, Robert Morris. It just you, you it doesn't take too much time. Google is this wonderful thing that if you actually type in you know, search criteria, it'll spit stuff out at you uh, based on your searches. It's not that hard. Yeah. And so one has to wonder, you know, if the if the quote from Shakespeare se- applies here, because I mean, him taking offense at that that tiny little thing that lady said. How does the Shakespeare quote? I think thou doth protesteth too much. Mm-hmm. Something, something's a nefarious afoot here. Let me let me explain a little bit of wh- how I understand Dr. Brown's argument. So when he says the NAR doesn't exist or is a conspiracy theory, he's he's um, not denying that there are people that believe in modern day apostles. He will look at some of. Um, our definition, um, just the way it's described, and the way it's described sometimes is like this. So the NAR would be the belief in the modern day governing offices of apostle and prophet. With that, that's kind of like the core main thing. And with that would come new revelation, um, like strategies that are essential for the Great Commission, um, uh, you know, apostles govern, have extraordinary authority. Uh, there's spiritual warfare stuff connected to it. There's like dominionism involved. And these, as we, as I go down that list, I would say these are more secondary um, parts of that definition where we would say not everyone agrees with Every, like not everyone who believes in governing apostles would agree with all these different smaller points of theology. There's going to be some variation there. So what Brown does is he'll look at that, which we're calling this loose-knit movement where not everyone agrees. And he'll say, well, nobody that I know fits all of these categories, like checks all of these boxes. Therefore, it doesn't exist. And I think that's unfair because none of us are saying that all these secondary points of doctrine are always like part of everyone involved in apostolic uh, governing offices. So that's Mm -hmm. that's just how I've seen him argue that point. I'm going to chime in on that because when he has done more than one video on the topic of Here's what the critics are calling the NAR. He always goes back to the article, or he has gone back to the article that was on Amy's blog, but actually I wrote it with Amy. In fact, I'm pretty sure if my memory is right, I wrote most of that entire thing, and and I and we were sharing stuff back and forth, and she put it up. And that's what he looks at and says, here's what my critics are saying is their definition of this fictitious thing, the NAR. And when he reads through it, I know what it says, like I said, because I wrote, if not all of it, most of it. There's a middle section where I say that it's a loosely knit group. This isn't a bunch of people operating behind the scenes secretively. Some of these beliefs are overlapping with each other, but not 
all of them are cohesive to the entire group because, like I said, it's a loose-knit group. And he skips over that part when he reads that page because he wants to make it look like we're a bunch of conspiracy theorists who continue to talk about this group of people meeting behind closed doors trying to take over the world. And none of us have actually said that. I think we've done, done a pretty good job of describing this loose-knit movement. He doesn't want to yeah. admit to that because I think he's got this narrative that he just keeps pushing. It's easier than doing the hard work to actually seriously address this issue. He's just pushing a narrative that's fictitious. And I, I would jump in there, too, and say that, um, you know, not all you, you said that Brown would say not all of the people meet all of the criterion that we put forth as critique. That's true. But them meets some of those criterion. <laughs> and those are his friends. Um, and then I would say he appeared on Shayan's uh uh, show, I forget what his show is called uh, off the top of my head, but he appeared and, and Shay on called Brown an apostolic evangelist. And so Shay on has written the gold standard book on this topic, modern day apostles operating in your office, apostolic office and anointing. So they believe in an office and anointing. These are descriptions we take from their own works. That's what I've written when I write stuff. And I write about this or describe the movement. I take their own descriptions. So Shayan's a friend of his or someone who he's been on his show. So, um, I mean, we're, we're describing what they describe and what yeah. they speak about. We don't take words out of context. I try to keep do my best to keep their words in their context, especially in that article I wrote recently. Um, th th of course, not every single teacher, uh, uh, you know, even the people who have given quotes here for his book, you know, Sean Bowles, James Gall, they probably don't all agree on every point. No one, no, not, not every cessationist agrees on every point of cessationism even, you know. Um, I think in the room we probably have uh, quite some disagreements on some things, right? But um, we, you know, we're, we're not all, we can't put us all in one category. We're not trying to put everybody in one cate category. But if you believe C. Peter Wagner by himself described the overarching movement, and if you belong to the movement, you, you would believe in modern day apostles and uh, governing apostles and prophets. And so those are, the, those are the main things that you would have to hold to. And so... I think um, he's he's making a sweeping statement and saying you can't you can't judge anyone basically in this movement yeah. if they don't mm -hmm. fit all the criterion that you're putting out. Um, That's not fair. The other way they get out of that category is like, well, they'll deny believing in governing apostles, but they'll say they believe in servant leadership. Even Cheon writes servant. It's servant leadership in that book while still saying apostles govern. So. It's kind of like trying to smooth the hard language over so that it's mm -hmm. not as recognizable or offensive um, as, you know, the critics are pointing out. So, yeah, it's, well, it's the difficult. Other, the other part that's frustrating, too, is that it's it seems as though he's running cover and again, I don't want to put words in people's mouths. That's not what I'm trying to do, but it just, you just can't help but see that every time there's a disagreement or a contention with one of these people being defined as new apostolic, he's almost putting words in their mouth for them because they've already said otherwise. It's it's not like Dr. Brown saying this makes it so that they're not. You know, cheon has been very clear that he is. Yep. Bill Johnson's yeah. very clear that he is. I mean, and, they, and, they've, all, and Michael, they've all said these things. Michael Brown would agree that Cheyenne is probably the closest to Nar because he was a direct disciple of Wagner, I believe. Yeah, um, and, and the, the, like it's 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 uh, at some point you just have to let the source be the source and and let them speak for themselves. You can't. You know, we've all given commentary on things and we've all said they given our take on something, but it's a take on what has been said, not changing what has been said. Um, and it feels mm -hmm. like the, the commentary is changing to, well, no, that this is what they really meant. And it's, you know, it, not, not to be absurd, but it's, it's like someone says the sky is blue and you're like, 
what they really said was the sky isn't there at all. And it's like no, <laughs> we can what you're just, on what, what, yeah. What, what you're describing is damage control, which we've just seen in the grave so- soaking episodes. Um, Absolutely. When Absolutely. a critic comes to you and confronts you about an error, there's a tendency for people to want to uh, kind of avoid being pinned down, right? Um, uh, with the roundtable with Holly Pivik and Doug Givet with Dr. Brown, um, he brought up Mark Chirona. He is a friend of his. He contacted him. Um, they had labeled him as NAR in their book. And he asked Mark questions and Mark apparently tried to uh, deny believing certain points about NAR to avoid being under that definition. Yet Mark Chirona is another person who endorsed Cheon's book, Modern Day Apostles. So it's yeah. like, There's always something among other do. things. Yeah. 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 And that, that's, that's the, yeah. That, that's the hard part is that it's, it's, it keeps, it's never, honestly, like we're never going to get to a point where it's um it, it's for lack of a better term it's just linguistic theft it's like you know no matter what we say it's just going to be changed into something else rather well, than agreeing it, on a term and definitions i think it's more diabolical than that because the the result of brown's argument is no people are no longer sitting there going wait a second is Shayon really an apostle is 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 uh, is bill johnson really an apostle is catherine crick really an apostle should we and they're not asking the question whether or not we should should test to see whether these are true apostles or false apostles at the end of brown's argument the issue is the critic who's saying that they're not Okay, they, that yep. he's made us the issue rather than the people who are clearly not apostles, claiming to be apostles right. today. That's and see, that's the whole point of of his of his apologetic. It's designed to get you off topic, no longer questioning whether or not Shayon is a true apostle or Bill Johnson is or all these other hosts of people are. Instead, it, it, it's those it's those wascally cessationists and those in their evil diabolical scheme to to defame the the name of Christ that they're the ones that are the problem and see that's the issue is that's the result of his argument is it basically makes us the issue rather than the people claiming to be apostles today yep that's exactly right that's exactly right well let's I, I move to, on I to, to, to our one, third okay can I say sure. one thing about because uh, about the clip actually so Tara said she had gone to gateway um Evan Peitch, um, Dr. Evan Peitch has uh, done his dissertation work on this very issue. He was part of Gateway Church himself, Mm -hmm. and he wrote his uh, dissertation on C. Peter Wagner and his open theism. And Wagner said of himself, when I heard of open theism in the early 2000s in the debate and the controversy in the the evangelical uh, theological society, that he was born again, theologically born again. So uh, Evan Peitch linked open theism to C. Peter Wagner, and um, it's an aberrant uh, view of God and, and that he is not all-knowing and not even not sovereign either. And so yeah. uh, Evan Peitch's uh, dissertation, a Southern Baptist Seminary dissertation, wrote on this and included Gateway Church in the NAR and made connections that they are apostolic, they, they are in some way it, within the uh, framework of the new apostolic reformation. So there's been academic work on that too. If Wagner would want to see that stuff, he can look at Dr. Evan Peitch's dissertation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he, yeah, like you said, came out of the church and believes that that was NAR as well. <laughs> um, so I'd like to move on to our third uh defaming clip if we can all right this focuses on repentance uh let me let me lead up and intro this a little bit so in this episode i'm critiquing the films of darren wilson and i have clips of him admitting that um he doesn't ever have anyone in his film's call people to repent or talk about hell or the wrath of God or anything like that. When I, when I film a lot, 
is I don't know if we've ever filmed. Like, you need to repent. Like, there's I don't think anybody has ever said that in any of my movies, which is why I get picketers outside of myself. Yeah. Because it's like what what we present is Jesus loves you, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. But what the the other what like yeah. our our other brothers and sisters who kind of get upset with us mm-hmm. will say, but you're not giving them the whole picture. Romans you're showing them yeah. a small. You're showing them one part of that. God's love, and you're not showing them the wrath that He has and how much He hates their sin. And so you're not, and that's why they get angry and frustrated with us because you're not giving them the full picture. That, yeah. So that's kind of the context that we're talking about when. when um, this this man named Jamie Galloway brings up what he thinks about um, our version of repentance. The question is not, did you feel the Holy Spirit while I prayed for you? The question is, while I preached the gospel to you, right? Do you now trust in Christ? Is he your only hope? Are you recognizing beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's no hope in me and in my flesh? And so you're not, and that's why they get angry and frustrated with us because you're not giving them the full picture. That, yeah, that that though that version of repentance does not make sense to me. It doesn't. So there's this clip where Darren is addressing the critique that in his movies they don't really emphasize repentance, and one of the other guys at the table goes out there and he says, "Yeah, I don't really get that kind of repentance," and he makes the point that it's a bad thing to pray to God, oh, I'm so wretched. When I think of repentance, it's like the joy of my salvation. Mm -hmm. And when I think of repentance, I don't think of, man, I am so horrible. I could never, ever do anything to please God. Oh, God, what a wretched person that I am. That doesn't, that does not bring any kind of help to me personally. And it was crazy because he basically just quoted the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 and made the point that that's not how we're supposed to pray, right? You know, popular psychology has come into the church in a very big way, and it tells us that we are victims now, that in, we, we're, we're broken, we're sweetly broken victims instead of people who are wretched. Paul declares in Romans 7, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He goes all throughout that chapter to say, even when I will to do good, evil is present with me. And it's only from the place of despair that he can conclude at the end of the chapter, I rejoice in Jesus Christ, who has given me the victory because in him there is no condemnation. The kind of joy he's looking for is a feel-good, counterfeit Christianity. Now do your part and get rid of a deficit mentality. Get up every morning and say, Father, thank you that I am enough. I think what the world is looking for is a feel-good message, a, a Joel Olstein message that, you know what, you are enough, you're okay. I think we have so much of that in today's society. Like, you are not enough. You are not enough. You are not enough. And that kind of repentance, I think, gets no one anywhere. That's more penance than Mm -hmm. repentance. And unfortunately, that message is actually being perpetuated in many uh, popular Christian books right now. You're enough. But we aren't. Jesus is enough. And so really, we're hearing rebellion there. We're hearing, I don't want to think about repentance as something negative. I want to think about my joy in following Jesus. Well, unfortunately, you're following a very different Jesus if you're not thinking about repentance in the right way. So, a different repentance. Um, Michael Brown's problem with that clip was he did not think it was fair to compare Jamie's view to Joel Osteen. Even though they are literally the same he is clearly saying the um, I am enough. He doesn't like the you are not enough. And that's the same thing that Joel Osteen teaches. I thought the comparison was completely fair, but I guess that's defaming and unethical and unbiblical. So <laughs> it, it, it was completely fair, Brandon, completely fair. And, and that what we just watched is is Oh, oh my goodness! It it is it 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 is gut riching because that is that is definitive proof that these people do not have the slightest clue 
as to what biblical repentance is. They actually mock biblical repentance. Yeah. That, that is definitive proof that they have a fundamental misunderstanding of the very basics of the gospel, the very basics of the gospel. Uh, what we just heard from uh, Jamie there, th that is not something generate man says. And I'll be glad to take ownership of that. I'll put it on myself. I won't put those words in your men's mouth. I'll gladly own those words. That, that is that is not someone who understands what repentance is. That is not someone who understands the gospel. This is a what we just listened to there is a definitively different gospel. I would note that it flies in the face of Scripture, too. And uh, uh, Michael yeah. Brown knows the Bible better than this uh, for him to take issue like that. And, and, and here's yeah. what I mean. Jesus tells the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in uh, in Luke chapter 18. And here's what it says. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Just, just listen to the words. I mean, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They thought they were enough. Okay. Uh, and he says, and they treated others with contempt. And here's the parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, I thank you, God, that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Mm -hmm. That's Joel Osteen's theology right there. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's the same, it's the same theology. It's just, it doesn't come with the Southern twang, but here's the, here's the penitent one. The tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And, and, and the, and the Greek word for merciful here, helostomy, it's referring to the actual sacrifice that's being sacrificed at the third, at the, at three in the afternoon. It's the time of the evening sacrifice. And so he's saying, be, be, be merciful to me in, by virtue of that sacrifice. It's to me, be, sa be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. And it was absolutely breathtaking to hear that fellow from the Holy Ghost movie sit there and talk down what Christ actually said, that we are to humble ourselves and say that we are not enough, that we are the problem. We have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed by the things we've done and left undone. We don't deserve anything from God except His wrath, and we then need to cry, cry out to Christ for mercy. And the good news is that Christ has bled and died for our sins. He is our sacrifice. He is enough. The fact that Michael Brown would take issue with that section of, of, uh, of, the, mm. of this movie is just mind-boggling. Yeah, it's it really... Um... It, it, I think the part, everything you just said, Chris, is spot on. And it, I think what, what it, it accounts to is kind of the mountain of evidence that begins to pile up. Because if you take each thing individually, you can, I hate to say brush it aside because you can't brush aside someone just blatantly, like, as you said, just flew in the face of scripture. But it, it's, it, it is very much par for the course for this, this sect of Christianity um, or this branch, we will call it that. It, it repentance isn't the key factor. It's that you are amazing. As as someone who led treasure hunts at Bethel and taught how to do treasure hunts at Bethel, that we didn't when we found someone who was the treasure. It wasn't now. Let me teach you how to repent. It was you're absolutely amazing. God loves you. You're incredible. You know you're so important to God that He pointed you out. Not you're wretched. You need to be repent. Repentance. We didn't teach people that were on treasure hunts to t when they found someone to evangelize to, to repent. So one could argue we didn't even evangelize to them, but that, right. that was, that, that was what we were taught to do. And that's what I taught people to do. And so it's, it, I feel like it's the piling on of evidence that it, it, it becomes this overwhelming thing. Cause that's what it was for me coming out of that movement. It wasn't just the one time it was, I mean, I, I'm always so humbled to be in a situation like this because it started off watching one of Chris's videos and then seeing one of Steve's videos and then seeing one of Justin's videos <laughs> and then watching American gospel. And it's like, here I am now on a panel with American gospel, which is crazy. But it, it was, it was that mountain of evidence that kept piling on. And it's like when you can, when you're arguing to pull things, things out and not, and you're trying to make light of these, 
it um it keeps people like myself from getting out of the movement and and really realizing for the the um i mean i don't know if, uh, the blasphemy that it is i guess you would say it, i know i'm a little bit out of turn but i, I want to give a hearty amen to what jesse said and i have watched i have watched dozens and dozens and dozens of gospel um witnessing encounters by todd white and he does exactly what Jesse just described. He goes up to people and tells them, oh, you're fabulous. You're amazing. God just, you're amazing. You know, he just, he tells people how wonderful that they are, that they're all that in a bag of chips. There's no sin, uh, mention of sin. There's no call to repentance because he himself doesn't understand what repentance is. Uh, I have never heard Todd White give a, a true, clear presentation of the gospel to anyone out on the street. And Bethel, I've done a video on my YouTube channel. People can go back and find it. But um, I've, I show some video clips of Bethel baptisms and the, the people that they baptize. And they ask them to, they say, they go up to each baptismal candidate, ask them two questions. What is your name? Second question, why do you want to be baptized? I've watched hundreds of these. I can honestly tell you, I've never heard a single uh testimony uh, from anyone being baptized at Bethel that would even pass a first grade vacation Bible school kind of testimony. Uh, one lady, they, they baptized because she said for the animal kingdom, that was her testimony and they baptized her. Shocking. I mean, just absolutely shocking. Yeah. I would. Uh, I want to ask a question for clarification, uh, Brandon. Um, why is it not fair for Galloway to be compared to Osteen? And what's his contention with that? I honestly, he didn't really get in detail. It was just, just that it's not fair. Um, I think he would be more quick to point out that Joel Osteen is in error. I think he's written to Joel before um, okay. and and if, has publicly spoken a little bit about him. Um, so maybe it was just offensive to put Jamie in the same category. I don't know if he knows Jamie or not. So, so I wasn't really so given would, an explanation. <laughs> so I take it that Brown finds something objectionable to Osteen. So – if he, why does if he finds something objectionable to Osteen, why does he find objectionable to other folks who are far worse than Osteen? Honestly, I mean Osteen's, you know, kind of um, all shucks Christianity, you know, um, and uh, and is you know everybody's good and everybody's cool. He, he's Pelagian. He's the he's the Texas Pelagian. Um, let's say, um, and uh, I got Chris there. That's good. Yeah, I got him surprised on that one. Um, so, you know. Um, why, why take issue with him next to Galloway? Um, I guess he actually finds uh, Osteen objectionable. So um, and one, one thing I wanted to point out, the two things that got uh, stuck out to me in that clip, especially um, Galloway said, uh, the joy of my salvation, the re that kind of repentance doesn't make me think of the joy of my salvation. He's got it backwards. First thing, the joy of someone's salvation only comes after one has repented and put their faith in Jesus Christ. You're not mm -hmm. saved until you've done that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen. <laughs> um, repentance uh, comes um, uh, and, and, and you're saved. Uh, you're not saved before that. So you can't have the joy of your salvation unless you've repented. Um, and uh, so it's a backwards, let's say a backwards uh, uh, soteriology, you know, um, they have it backwards. You're not saved. And uh, and this this whole concept, the whole idea that they're presenting it seems to to me to have to have sort of a Pelagianism background. Man is basically good, um, which is secular humanism. It's not Christianity. Man is not basically good. Man is does have a sin nature that must be repented of, and faith in Christ must be must be uh, had to be saved. And no one can be saved without it. Yeah. Yep. I think the um the the phrase that I go over in that episode they use 
the scripture, the kindness of God leads to repentance. And they kind of take that out of context, mm -hmm. which is a verse surrounded by judgment mm -hmm. stuff. And they just treat it like, well, let's just love bomb these people because telling them to repent is not kindness. So I would, we're going to pray interject? for their healing they, or prophesy. Yeah. They've even misunderstood the phrase. If they've, they've taken the phrase out of context, but the kindness of God, not our kindness. Yeah. Our kindness doesn't do anything. It helps. It can help and it, it assists. And we ought to be kind and generous and, and loving as Christians. But the kindness of God leads people to repentance. It's his work. Um, and so, sorry, I'm showing my reform colors there probably, but uh, God's, God leads us to repentance. Um, we are his, his, his tools, the tools in his hand. We are necessary. We are, we are needed in gospel proclamation, but the kindness of God leads to repentance. They've taken that context, that, that, even that phrase out of context. Okay. Let me jump in because this clip that you, that we're all talking about, when I saw that, I, I put it on my YouTube channel before I was making my own videos. I was just archiving stuff. And I remember thinking, when people see this, boy, they're really going to get upset and this is going to cause a commotion. And what I discovered was that a lot of people who are Christians in some form, at least in their own mind, they didn't see the problem with that. It didn't really make that big of an impact on people. And I think this is very telling. You know, if yeah. that if that clip didn't cause Dr. Michael Brown to go, wow, that guy is out of, he's way out of line. Yeah. Instead to defend him and to say it was unfair of you to equate him to Joel Osteen when they are doing the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah. Bill Johnson lied to Dr. Michael Brown, in my opinion, when he interviewed him. And he said, oh, yeah, we talk about repentance. I'm like, really? Why don't you produce some evidence of that? Because I've listened to you. I've, I did a video on one of his altar calls, and he says nothing about the need to repent before a holy God because we're sinful. It just doesn't come up very much, if at all. So, yeah, th this is really concerning. The fact that, that Dr. Michael Brown, who is supposed to know the basics, this is Christianity 101. This is not some Reformed thing or Lutheran thing or Presbyterian or what. It's none of that. It's just basic Christianity. We're sinners. And I would, we need a savior. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would, I would, I'm pretty sure that Michael Brown agrees with a biblical view of repentance. I think what he would probably do is go and ask Jamie or a friend of his, does Jamie really believe this false view of repentance and he would be told the opposite. They would deny it in some form or we were misunderstood or taken out of context, which mm -hmm. I don't think is true. Um, so it's, it's difficult to understand the motive behind that because what I'm doing is I'm not, I'm not the cessationist picking on the continuationist view of gifts of the spirit I'm coming at this as both cessationist, continuationist, coming together, critiquing NAR and how they distort essential issues of the gospel, like repentance, the call of the gospel. Um, it's being distorted. We should all agree that the way that Ethel um, handles that issue, like the calling out the golden people, a very high view of man, it's all about man's greatness. I mean, I have a whole episode devoted to that. I, I <laughs> now knowing that um, he would nitpick this tiny little issue, I would. I can't imagine how he would respond yeah. to the it's, the larger. It's unfortunate because it's it really misses out an opportunity to stand hand in hand. Like this, this yeah. one of those things where I, I would have loved because that that's what it comes down to. It's like. Because I, I, I obviously still have plenty of friends out in the continuationist camp, and we go back and forth and that stuff. But whenever we hit these kind of topics, I rejoice when we can agree on we both need to repent. Like those, those are the things that like that we need as as brothers in Christ to stand on to say, listen, we can disagree on these things and other gifts of spirit, you know. But 
can we at least <laughs> at least get hand in hand on this? Like this is something we can't we can't fight over, and it should be the most basic doctrine. But the reality is, you know, it, it so as someone that was in that camp for so long, it you get so I mean, love bomb is a word to use, but you get so inundated with how amazing you are that it becomes offensive when you get told you need to repent because like, well, I don't need to repent. It's like, you know, not, you wouldn't say that out loud, but you can't help but feel that way when, you know, for three years you're told how incredible you are and how you're made for the most amazing things in the world. And you're supposed to see all these miracles. And then someone tries to bring you a gospel message of repentance. It's like, Oh, that's a stepping stone. That's Christianity one-on-one. I don't need to do that. I'm done with that. And it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's really unfortunate that we couldn't, I, I really would have loved to film pan out in a way where it's, listen, Dr. Michael Brown say something along the lines of we can disagree with this. We can disagree with this, but this I stand on. And I agree that we need to change this. And that would have been such a, a beautiful arc to have in the film. I, I want to piggyback on that too, Jesse. I agree a hundred percent. It would have been really nice to have his voice to that and actually say, uh, just ask the, answer the question. What, must we do to be saved? What, what that's the basic question of Christianity. What must man what must man do to be saved? And Peter answers that in his, in the very first sermon of all time. Repent and turn to Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And um that would have been really a a, a breath of fresh air I think for him to give his voice to um, what must man must do to be saved? And um, yeah, that's kind of sad because that's the fundamental question of Christianity. Yeah. Well, I'd like to kind of wrap this up with a final few points. Um, here's a, a comment that Dr. Brown wrote to me. He said, Brandon, First, as you know, your series engages in defaming comments about other ministries and leaders based solely on their opinions and experience. I don't think that's true. It's also based in facts and their words. This is unethical and unbiblical. I pleaded with you to make changes, but you refused. I didn't refuse. I offered him the chance to include his disagreement, and he refused. As for revival, okay, here's, here's, here's the final point. I mentioned to Dr. Michael Brown that I was making an episode, which turned to be two episodes, on grave soaking. <laughs> and that really created a big problem. He asked me um, if I was going to make an episode, a full episode on the positive fruit of revival. And I told him I didn't have enough content to make a whole hour episode on the positive fruit, but I had enough to make like a 30 minute if I wanted to. But my plan was to make an episode on revival and revivalism, the, what they viewed as the good, where do we both agree is the bad, um, Compare that, there's other people that don't like that paradigm at all. They just view it as like the ordinary means of grace is is the way to go. We shouldn't be looking for these movements. Um, so he brings up this, this issue. He says, as for revival, you had plenty of balanced comments from Dr. Clark and Daniel Kalenda and myself to use if you wanted. But your overall series is hardly balanced at all. Keep in mind, he's only seen those two episodes, a fraction of the series, and he's judging the overall series based on what I said about having three minutes of maybe positive revival content. And then he says, again, the fact that you're doing a whole episode on a massively fringe issue, grave soaking, despite it being renounced by key leaders who were near to it, Yet you could not put out one positive episode on revival, including caveats and concerns from people, um, demonstrates, again, that you are guilty of using unequal weights and measures. No, that's the main reason I ultimately had to pull out. (sighs) So I, I think what he, what he was doing is, judging a project that he hadn't seen. I think that's the definition of 
unequal weights and measures. He's not mm-hmm. judging rightly. And I told him I had a whole, you know, I had him and Daniel Kalenda talking about Brownsville and Randy Clark talking about Toronto and Will Hart talking about the good fruit of Toronto. And that would have been included in this episode. But if they all decide to remove themselves, they've just created the imbalance. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, we, I know that this, it's not going to be balanced, so we're going to remove ourselves, and they're contributing to the very thing that they were afraid of. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. So yeah. it's it's just really unfortunate. Um, I tried my best to work with them and offer them the chance to to add more commentary, but um, uh, Doctor Brown refused. So I have well, to. Just- acknowledge his wishes to remove himself from the project. Well, just a, just a comment on the, I mean, there's so much that we, we could go for hours on this, but man, just the, the comment on the grave soaking being, I forget the exact word you use a fringe, a fringe bit that happened. Um, and if yeah. you're watching this panel, you, you've, you've seen the episode. So you know that uh, even based on the commentary I provide that this wasn't just a fringe amount of people. This was direct relatives of Bill Johnson doing this and direct leadership of Bethel doing this. It wasn't a few aberrant students that went off. Mm -hmm. This was the son-in-law of Bill Johnson. His wife was doing this. Leadership Mm -hmm. at BSSM was doing this. And it was being done repeatedly. So again, I don't think even if it was just done once, it would that that's the other part too that I, I think is just appalling. Even if it was just done once, once is worthy of a discussion. That that that's mm-hmm. the that's the core issue. But it wasn't done just once, it was done multiple times, and it was documented multiple times, and it was encouraged multiple times. And then to say it's some fringe thing, it just it shows the lack of understanding of the severity that of the issue of what's been done. And we also have just, just, I mean, probably about three or four days before this was recorded, we have Daniel Kalinda given his commentary on the cessationist film. And he went as far as to say that we're heretics. Okay. I'm just going to come out and say it. Cessationism is heretical. It's one of the situations where like the, the, the Princess Bride was like, you keep using that word, but I don't think you know what it means. Because yeah, he <laughs> says we're brothers in Christ, but somehow yeah. it's heresy. Cessationism is heresy. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't consider cessationists brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> uh, and it's just like, I just, I don't think you understand what you're saying there. And and I, I don't throw that word around. And it's it's one of those things where I, I've, being someone who's very close to the issue and, and who still has people that are dear friends of mine, um, I mean, Mr. Peters, you've, you've thrown that word out and I know you said it with great conviction. I've, I've had a hard time saying it because some of these people are really close to me, not to say that I think you're wrong. And, and I just have a hard time throwing it out there because I'm just so close to it. But when, when we see what's happening and what these things that are being done and what's being preached and what's being taught and what's being practiced, it's, it's hard to say that it's just a fringe thing. When it's it's far, as you've seen these episodes, it's it's far from that. It's it's actually for a while was actually the mainstream thing in those circles. I guess to close, um, you've seen the episodes. Um, I would encourage everyone who's watched this live stream um, to talk about it direct people to watch this, you know, the reason, um, it's currently, um, private on AGTV is just because, um, we aren't finished with the film and this is just a way to reward our subscribers who support us. Um, eventually it'll be out there in the public in a final version. Um, I hope, and and pray that uh, the people that have 
engage in this practice, do finally repent of it. Um, and that Dr. Brown will change the way he describes this in the fact, like, you know, he's, he tells us we're sinning basically in the way we describe the practice. And I think, um, that's wrong. And I hope that he repents of that as well. Um, uh, thoughts guys. I'd like to say one thing, especially um, in relation to what he said, uh, that that the film or the sections that he's seen is defamatory or slanderous. To, for something to be defamatory, it has to be untrue. It can d- destroy someone's reputation, but it can be non-defamatory and be true, right? We, I, Everything I have said, you've interviewed me twice or a couple times with fillers, I have said nothing defamatory because it's all true, all of it. Everything I've said, my critique, what's happened, especially with the grave sucking thing, grave soaking, mantle grabbing, whatever you want to call it, whatever they call it, (laughs) whatever it's been called, um, uh, the practice of going to graves and receiving some anointing um, has happened. It's probably still happening, actually. And if there's as much evidence as there is of it, um, that's there, that it's happening as a regular occurrence. Um, and, um, so nothing I've said is untrue. Um, nothing I've seen, I've become a sort of an accidental expert in the movement because of grave sucking. Ben Fitzgerald's grave sucking made me aware of this movement. Like, what is this thing? What, how in the world, this is not Christian. And, uh, so I looked into it and sure enough, and as a follow up uh, to all that, um, I did speak with Ben Fitzgerald personally about this and I confronted him and, 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 and asked him to repent and he justified his actions. He doubled down. He did not repent to my knowledge still publicly. And, uh, so, um, we have not said anything defamatory, defamatory, the, the nature of the defamation, uh, means that you have said something untrue and, um, uh, it, it can cause harm to someone's reputation. Uh, but that's not slanderous. If it caught, just only causes harm to someone's reputation, it has to be untrue, legally speaking. My brother's a lawyer. so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Um, I think we're probably approaching two hours now. <laughs> Thanks for everyone who's stayed up this late. Um, uh, yeah, any other closing thoughts? I appreciate your time, guys. Um, Thanks, brothers. Indeed. Thank you all. Hey, Thanks for the hard work, Brandon. We appreciate it. Very glad to be a part of this. And I want to just encourage everyone who's watched so far to keep doing what you're doing. And that is get more information. Keep learning. Keep growing in your faith. And don't be discouraged by some of these things that we have to discuss here. Um, because this is what Christianity has always had to do. You've always had these battles of error, yeah. error versus truth. This is... Yeah. Uh, Maybe new to you because of the, your background, but if you look at church history, there's always been battles being fought. And so um, there is truth on the other side of things that aren't true. And, and that's where we're all trying to push you. And so keep doing what you're doing.